So, Hamia, uh, thank you for joining us on Islam Channel. Now, you're a, a writer, a poet, an activist, and you're known for talking about, I suppose, kind of thorny topics like Islamophobia, history and race. And your new book, Tangled in Terror, Uprooting Islamophobia, touches on all those elements. It's, it's out now. So can you begin by telling us a bit more about the book, please? Basically, I felt that the conversations around Islamophobia are quite surface level. What we see in this country is often, you know, we think of people being Islamophobic because they say something, um, you know, verbal harassment or because they, you know, physically harass somebody. Maybe we think Boris Johnson, you know, his comments about women in niqab being bank robbers or letterboxes. Um, we think of those things as Islamophobia. But what I really wanted to do with the book was say, well, these are just surface level things. Islamophobia has much deeper roots. It goes much further back in history. I think we even think that, you know, it's only since 9-11 that Islamophobia has existed in the world. But I wanted to write a book that really gives us a historical context and that also gives us a, a I guess, gives us somewhere to direct um, and target when we're making, when we're trying to resist Islamophobia. And what I mean by that is, you know, I think sometimes we, we think of Islamophobia in ways that makes it seem a bit random no, Islamophobia actually has beneficiaries. You know, there are governments that benefit from kind of creating this myth of Muslims as threats. They can then, you know, put up border controls, immigration controls, they can increase surveillance inside, and they can, you know, go to war um, outside of, you know, in other countries. So there was that element. And, and also remembering that Islamophobia makes people money. It lines a lot of pockets. You know, there are corporations that sell arms, there are corporations that sell surveillance technologies. Um, and all of this is done in the name of kind of securitizing, protecting the world against a Muslim threat. And, you know, we all know that that threat is seen to be a terrorist threat and that, you know, we're all bound up in that. We're all kind of assumed to maybe be a terrorist in the future. So I wanted, I wanted to really just, just provide a kind of a deeper and broader analysis about Islamophobia that maybe, inshallah, helps people to, to make those links, because I think those are the links we need to make if we want to resist it properly. The stuff that you kind of concentrate and look at, you know, Islamophobia, racism, history, colonialism, all that stuff is quite... It's quite heavy and it can sometimes, I suppose, weigh on the soul to some extent. So, so why do you do it? I think so. Yeah, this is, I love this question because I think it does sound all really heavy. And one of the things I was really conscious of writing the book was I don't want, you know, to give this book out to the world and Muslims just feel completely overwhelmed afterwards and go, oh, my God, it is awful. Some of them is everywhere. What do we do? And so actually what was really important to me um, was the, the message of hope, actually, and as Muslims, you know, I think that Islam is that hope. I think that the reason I write about this stuff is that, you know, it is incumbent upon us to reveal injustices. I think we're told to seek knowledge, to understand things, you know, how do these things work? Um, but really the goal with this is to show people this is all made. The context doesn't have to be like this. Things haven't always been this way. And that being the case, we can change them. You know, we, we, we know the hadith that if you see something, you can change it with your hand. If you can't change it with your hand, change it with your tongue. If not with your tongue, then with your heart. And I think the, the kind of um, invitation I make to readers at the end of the book is maybe not all of us are in a situation where with our hands we can change, you know, we're not necessarily in charge of policy and legislation. Um, but I think through conversation, we all have power. We all in our own homes, in our families, in our workplaces, wherever we are, have the power to do something. And, you know, we believe as Muslims, we're all placed, right? That we don't necessarily choose where we end up or what, you know, avenue we find ourselves in, but we're somewhere. And I think it's not that we all need to do the exact same thing, but it's that where are you and what what is it that you can do to try to make circumstances easier for others, but also for yourself? Because I think justice is something that we all deserve. And we're told that in the Quran that, you know, seek justice, even if it's against yourself, against your kin, your family, your parents. Um, and so I think that is what also, you know, inspires me. And I think whilst you said it's heavy on the soul, I think it's also that, you know, we we believe that the, the soul is also in submission to God. And so like, what does that, what does that mean? What should we be doing if we're trying to submit to God? And, and perhaps the place I've been placed is, you know, I write and I, and I, I do, I'm, I'm able to reach people through writing. So if that's the kind of responsibility I have, then inshallah, that's the one that I can do, but other people will be in different places. And so I hope that that is a bit hopeful in the sense that we can all do something depending on where we're placed.